Hi, thanks for tuning in to Thought Rock today. My name is Dave Hensman. I'm with my good friend Mike Satterfield. And you've uh, joined us on another episode of this program where we talk about issues and uh, different topics that we feel are pertinent to those who are seeking truth and understanding. Today we're going to talk about the issue of time. So Mike, time. It's time to talk about time. Yeah. How you doing? I don't know I have time. You don't have time? I don't. You're running out of time. <laughs> We got 55 minutes. We're running out of time. I'm running. We're running yeah. out of time. Yeah. No, it's good. So uh, time is no. relative. You have 55 minutes. I, ah. I haven't decided how much oh, time I actually have. There you go. Have, so. Time. We're gonna we're gonna grade this. Is, it, is that grade this on the curve or is something? That, is that what relativity means? <laughs> the theory. Right. The theory is we have time, and it's interesting. <laughs> time is an interesting topic because yes, we all it affects us all, and uh, we're all we all have a beginning, and we are all going to have an end. Mm. So here we are, caught in the middle of it, trying to figure it all out. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on on where do we start talking about time? Yeah. Probably at the beginning. We could start at the beginning. That's probably not a bad place to start. Right. If we're going to talk about time. Okay. It's interesting, biblically, from the scriptures, when you look at the whole concept of, of time and how the scriptures start dealing right from chapter 1 of Genesis about time. And that's been a very controversial topic right. because you have, of course, the two main schools of thought that if you have intelligent design and God is the author of creation... And so the Genesis account, is it literal? Yeah. Is it figurative or poetic? And some critics or some observers have said, if you look at Genesis 1 and 2, it does feel somewhat poetic in how it's written. And um, I've often said about that, you know, just because something is written in a more poetic format doesn't erode the fact or the reality of the truth. Right. So I could say to you, you know, I went outside my house and three feet away from the door was a red rose blowing in the wind. That's a very factual, evidential thing that you can right. go observe. Or I could say, you know, as I opened the door of my abode, you know, and as I gazed out over, you know, Three feet from the door, I could say the same things <laughs> right. in a more po. And right. you know, there I saw the hue of red. And as I looked closely, <laughs> hit I there the rose, there the, the rose, in you the know, summer breeze, exactly right. And the petals begin to, and at three o'clock, the petals begin to fall. <laughs> well, I can say that in a scientific, factual way, right? Or I can say it in a more poetic, well-written way, right? It doesn't negate the facts or the reality of what right. happened. Right. So I think the criticism that Genesis 1 and 2 seems to have this kind of a, a more of a musical poetic flow yeah. doesn't negate the reality of the factual information that's being proclaimed in it. Right. So that's, that's one thing. Okay? Right. Coming back to the issue of time. So if you if you look at you know the evolutionary worldview or or the the man centered understanding of what that's all about, time is this. It's time is for, for that theory is like a an unmeasurable resource. It's like they need lots of it. Yeah. It's it's very speculative on how it's even thought about and talked about. Mm -hmm. And then you have this other alternative version in Genesis, which God says, okay, this is what happened. In the beginning, right. God said. And so we have this very affirming, factual statement that if you're not going to believe it, then you have to argue against it. And then God goes into this whole thing about time right. in Genesis 1, where he talks about, you know, uh, and, you know, he separated the light and then all of a sudden the morning and the evening. And, he, and he, we get to this thing about day. Right. And the Hebrew word day there is the Hebrew word yom. yom. And critics of the scriptures have often said, well, yom doesn't mean 24 hours. It's like t it literally means time period. Yeah. Which is, I believe, accurate. Sure. Except for the fact that then God quantifies the yom. Right. With this specific morning and evening. Right. There's at least two, sometimes three qualifications with every mention in in chapter two. Right. 
right? Yeah. So, so one of the things that's helped me with that, and I know this is a struggle for a lot of Christians who want to take the Bible seriously, but struggle with Genesis 1 and 2, is that Genesis 1, I've always, uh, I don't remember where I first heard this, but you know, you're thinking, like, this is the thumbnail sketch of the creation. Something much bigger. Right. right. So you're at the Google Earth 30,000 foot view seeing this broad picture of the creation account. And then in Genesis 2, you're zooming in yes. to street level. Yep. And you're getting the detailed account. It's not two separate accounts. No. It's a it's a, it's a bird's eye view of a broader perspective right. versus street level view in the details of what's happening. Well, if God if God laid out for us the technical information of creation <laughs> you, you know, know forget genesis one right try you know a thousand volumes of who knows how many pages of technical detail you'd have to go through to figure it all out yeah. right so you're right the purpose of the scriptures <clears throat> wasn't to give mankind an exact treatise of what god did right it's it's our story and god's redemptive plan so that's you know, another discussion for another day. But coming back to Genesis, we have this issue of time. Yeah. So God in Genesis 1 and, and throughout that chapter, he, and this is what's interesting about whether you say it's, you know, factual or poetic, and I think it's both. I think it's poetically yeah, factual. Yeah. It's interesting to me, though, how in every day God continuously repeats this quantifying terminology around yom he goes morning and evening was the first day morning and evening was the second day mm -hmm. and then the third day, morning and evening. he quantifies the yom yeah. on every day in the genesis one account well even if he didn't so so i, I think it was a ken ham somebody i heard years ago say here, here's, here's the phrase in my father's day it took a day to drive across our property property during the day Right. So I just use the word day three different times in three different contexts with three different meanings. Right. But you understood what I meant that in my in my in the time when my father was alive, it took yes. it took uh, the whole day, a twenty four yeah. hour period, to drive across our property during the the daylight portion of the day. Right. 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 So context is everything. Absolutely. In the scripture. Right. And Genesis has context. Yeah. And he, and it's quantified. Yeah. So, okay, so, so let's say, for the sake of argument then, I mean, you have this beginning moment for creation, mm -hmm. but that's not the beginning moment of history, right. because there's a prehistory of God completely before the earth is created. Yeah. And whether or not you believe God created or not, if you want to go to the Big Bang Theory, okay, that there was nothing... Right. And then boom, okay? Well, before the boom, there's a history as well. Yeah. So you cannot separate this issue of God's creation versus an evolutionary worldview from the issue of time. Right. So time kind of stands on its own in a way, although God created time for our context. Yeah. It's so its own dimensionality. It's, it's, yes. But it's in relationship to other... To realities. something far bigger. Right. So time that we experience is a reality, but not the only reality. Right. Which is why I've always found it difficult when I hear scientific the scientific community say, well, you know, the planet blah, 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 blah is 285 million light years away. And, I ha and so there's this kind of measurement of how they think light travels. But all that we've learned about light traveling is from where light is received, not from where <laughs> light originates. Right. Okay. What if God made light in transit? Yes. Or, you know, I, I've, and I love this analogy. It's like the, the ant climbing up on a blade of grass, looking over the lawn, <laughs> seeing the forest and the mountains, and speaking with authority on how the mountains were made. <laughs> he hasn't even made it off the backyard yet. <laughs> That's a good analogy. Right? So we make all these emphatic statements about time and light and how it travels. Right. But we are the ant on the blade of grass going, this is what we think. Yeah. But we've never approached it from Alpha Centauri back in. Right. Yeah. There should be probably a little bit more humility in that conversation. <laughs> In and the scientific I, community, and, and yeah, and later in our <laughs> later in this episode, I want to talk a little bit about 
how we can get to that place of humility when God confronts Job. Yeah. And we'll kind of come back to that a little bit later. Yeah. Good. So, so let's continue down this whole, the, the, this concept of the, the interdimensionality of time. We live in this zone of time or this time frame. Yeah. But that's not all. There's more to it than that. Well, it's weird. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember if I was reading Chuck Missler or who it was who's detailing an experiment that the, uh, the U.S. government did where they put, um, they had the, you, know, you have the atomic clocks, yes. right? Yeah. And then they, they put a clock in a plane and sent the plane to a particular altitude in, in you know, flying over the, the globe. Right. And the clocks, when, when the plane landed again, they were not synchronized. They were right. off. And so, just the distance away from the Earth, like time, time is even at thirty thousand feet. Yes, in that condition, and so it's like okay. So then there's a there's a there's something to have having to do with uh, uh, the the Earth itself, the our proximity, our place yes. in the in the solar system, our place in God's creation. Um, so time, yeah, time's this really weird thing. Mm-hmm. That it, I, I don't want to go so far as to say it's. Uh, man-centered or it's, it's related but it does seem to be a construct that God made for us as human beings to live in and therefore you know I, I don't know like how do how do animals experience time like nobody knows what, what, right. what are they experiencing I guess it depends which animal the sloth I mean he might he, right <laughs> the guys at the DMV the cheetah the, sl- <laughs> the that cheetah right. yeah, that's right <laughs> but yeah. but it's interesting because when you, well, so when you look at time in our dimension which, which is interesting because you look if you look at the Genesis account of a 24-hour day right and and God's work of creation in these periods of 24 hours which you know and coming back to my analogy of, of the guy harvesting the field you know the guy harvesting the field 200 years ago had a scythe yeah and so he was only able to do what he could do with a scythe in one day a guy with a combine harvester with that technology and that in ingenuity was able to do far more in the same time period mm-hmm. right same as your, your analogy about walking across the field in your father's day you know so right the the issue is not so much time but what an entity is able to do within time. Yeah. So a toddler can't build a house in three or four weeks, but a seasoned carpenter can. Right. Okay. Time hasn't changed, but uh, the ability of the person within time sets a completely different course. So my point is, God, what God was able to do in a 24-hour time period is way different than what a toddler can do in a 24-hour time time period, right? Absolutely. So so with humility, you got to come back to that issue and go, before I just wipe out what God says he did in six literal days, I don't know what resource, what technology, what power, what ingenuity, what design, what ability drove God's ability to do what he claims he did. Right. So for me to arrogantly say that didn't happen the way Genesis said it did, right? That's hugely arrogant, <laughs> and I'm the little ant again, going, "I know what's up in the mountain." Well, it took me at least six or seven days to build the Lego Death Star set, and it's like, okay, but you didn't cast the molds for all the different Lego pieces and pour the plastic, right? You, yeah, you didn't. You, you didn't start. Let's let's just. Let's use that analogy. You you didn't start with anything. Right. You just spoke. Let's say you spoke the molds into existence and you spoke the plastic into existence and then you spoke melt and you melted the plastic. Right. Then we'd have something analogous to the creation account, right? Right. Out of nothing, ex nihilo, God speaks and he creates from nothing. Right. Right. Um, So so all we know as human beings, finite human beings, is... We've got some resource that we start with that is outside ourselves. God is starting with nothing. Well, did you not hear the conversation that God had with the modern scientists? And apparently the, not. The modern scientists said, "Well, God, you know, we've got so much technology on Earth now that we we know that we can we could create Earth just like you did." Mm-hmm. God says, "Great, let's have a competition." So God stoops down and gets a handful of dirt and. The scientist scoops down and gets a handful of dirt. Guys, says, whoa, whoa, whoa! You have to get your own dirt, <laughs> right? So yeah. the, the point is, yeah. you know, we're we are the recipients on a planet that got here, yeah, not by our building, right? 
Okay. And, and we talked about this previously, and not by random chance. So there's, there's too much design to attribute what we have to random right. processes. So if I look at the systems I see on the earth and the planet, animal life, uh, plant life, I saw a tree the other day that had been struck by lightning and you were able to see the vascular system within the wood tree. Yeah, yeah. It blew my mind of the complexity of what goes on in a tree yeah. as it's sucking up the hundreds of gallons of water it does in a two or three day period to survive and thrive. So here we are on this planet that we didn't build in a, in a system that we see complexity. There's no reason to say that the time we live in is also designed right because anytime you look at time time is a very mechanical and a very measurable thing yes so we look at the 24-hour day and it's not like you only get one 24-hour day to study every couple of years yeah every day is a 24-hour day the sun comes up the sun goes down the moon the cycles of the moon like if you can't see the mathematics we chart the patterns right we chart the weather we chart our yeah. calendar it's all charted that's all numbers it's all math yeah the the rotation around the sun is in a is in a cycle it it, it follows the pattern yeah. the earth tilts and goes back and forth which is why that's not global warming by the way that's just the general rotation of the earth on its axis yeah. back and forth over a hundred to two hundred years which is why they had vineyards in northern England 200 years ago and they don't have them there today right right so all that to say, we're in the middle. This this time measurement is a very mathematical measurement. Yeah. So where do we go? What? How do we? What does it all mean? Yeah, it's a good question. I think one of the problems is that when we have this conversation. Your point about the dirt is really the salient point. We, we get deep in the weeds of the, how we measure time and. Trying to figure out what time is or how, how it functions in relationship to other dimensionalities. And, um, and, and we just we lose sight of the fact that like, where, where did it even come from? Like, what is this construct that we live in? Right. Why did God, why did he create time? That's the question that I've wrestled with most. Is, sure. Um, and and it, what it does is it, I think time is meant to probably more than anything else, humble us. Mm-hmm. And the passage of time remi- reminds us that we are finite beings mm-hmm. and that we have an expiration date. Um, but more than that, it, 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 ca- it should cause us to look to God, to look up and say, okay, there's got to be something more. There's no, right. there's no other explanation for what we're experiencing other than there is a being with infinite power who, who made all these things and set us in this construct it, you know, it's just well. If that isn't true, then everything else is meaningless, and I mean that from a hard, cold yeah. fact reality. If we're not living in a design construct for a purpose beyond ourselves, yes, nothing else matters. It, it really doesn't matter. And you can say, "Well, live your best life now," or <laughs> discover discover your your human potential. Right. Well, why? For what purpose? It's like the it's like the businessman. Walks into the park and he sees the hippie smoking dope under the tree. And the business says, you know, why don't you go to school? And the hippie goes, well, why? He says, well, if you go to school, you get an education. And the hippie goes, well, why do I want an education? He says, well, if you get a good education, he says, you can go out and get a good job. And he says, if you get a good job, you'll you'll get wealthy. And the guy goes, well, why do I want to do that? He says, well, when you get wealthy, he says, man, you can set your own course. And the hippie says, what do you mean by that? He says, well, when you're wealthy, you can do whatever you want. The hippie goes, I'm doing what I want right now. Right. So without any kind of, <laughs> right? So without, yeah. without any kind of reason beyond if it's all just random chance and we're yeah. not here for a purpose yeah that's it it literally means life does not matter that's right and let it be the survival of the fittest so why should i care about humanity right why would i care that covid's taken out people who cares right survival of the fittest baby we're all involved on, ever- on a side note that's been one of the most um frustrating points of contention for me in the midst of the covid stuff 
in a, in a culture that largely has embraced Darwinian evolution as our construct, as the, the process by which we got here, why do you why does anybody care right. whether somebody else gets COVID and dies? But like shouldn't we want that? Shouldn't yes, we, we want the weaker yes. animals in the herd to be thinned out right. so that we might rise up into some new uh, evolutionary stage Absolutely. where we're stronger? I, I, it, Cull but it the speaks herd. to me. Yeah. Cull the herd, man. Totally. And so it speaks to me like there's still in the heart of man, largely, I think this this root in in uh, in the creation, we can't get away from it in some regard. You know, we try to educate educate indoctrinate right. people into evolution into secularism, but it, in the heart, it's like well, well, we got to help these people. We got to help people. Well, why would you want to help people? Right, they're only in the way. Yeah, let the sick and dying die, and we only have so much time. Why, why do we want these people getting in the way of our consumption of goods and services? I've only got X amount of time. Get out of the way. Right. Go, why would we waste it, our yeah. resources on those that are going to die anyway? Absolutely. And I, I'm tired of evolutionists not being good evolutionists. They're yeah. hypocrites. Inconsistent. Like it's inconsistent. So like if you're going to be an evolutionist, wipe out. We don't need hospitals. Right. We don't need any of the medical science of that stuff. Who You know, you want to prolong life of years? Why? Spend your time just enjoying life. Forget about the whole concept. Right. Now, that sounds, people say, well, that's so jade and so wrong. Yeah. The reason that sounds wrong is because within us, the law of God dictates right. that life is important. Well, why is life important? Things are only important if they have a purpose. Yes. I don't think lint is important, <laughs> you know? So I know that, that if I'm just human lint, if I'm just taking up space... Without a purpose, there's no importance to me at all. Right. But we know deep in our heart, deep in the psyche of man, we know that human life is valuable. So time in this construct that we live in, we recognize that there is a, there's got to be a purpose to life mm -hmm. if God put us in a, in a time zone, in a time... If he's given us this time, it's got to mean something. Yeah. Yeah, and it's weird too, like the seven day week? Where do we where would we get that concept? Right. Why, why is that a thing? Why is it why, an why, eight day week? Right, or a ten. You know, I read actually, it's been years ago, I read uh, some history book. The French actually tried to go to a ten day week and they almost like killed each other. Like the, the whole society almost imploded right. because nobody could do it. It just wasn't possible. So we got seven days. Why do we have seven days in a week? Right. And why do we rest on one? Yeah. And, you know, I've always said this about the, the ten. I've always said this about the Ten Commandments. Um, and I'm, I'm actually working on a, a, some, a deeper study on the Ten Commandments that I, that I hope to publish one of these days. But um, the, the Ten Commandments, God says in the middle there, he goes, and remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy or keep it completely. Can re yeah. Make sure you observe the Sabbath day. Right. Now, here's here's the one law in the Ten Commandments, okay, that makes absolutely no sense to break. God says, okay, one day a week, I want you to do nothing. Right. I want to relax, chill out, <laughs> rest. Enjoy your family. Enjoy your family. Re <coughs> regroup. <coughs> right. And we're going... No way. You can't tell me to rest. I'll work seven days. So people, so now we're in our culture, right? Right. And we've got everything's open seven days a week. We've got everything going seven days, seven days, seven days. We're the most stressed, mm -hmm. wore out, fatigued, right? Because yeah. we're not, we're not even receiving the gift. Yeah. That is encoded in the. I mean, there's a whole. To me, there's a whole bunch more things encoded in the Ten Commandments that are. I think the whole, all ten of them are gifts. Yes. Which is a discussion for another time. But, but even in this one, which is to me is the most obvious gift. Take one day, sleep in, relax. Yeah. Be with your fan jam, hang out. You can't tell me to relax. Yeah. God, I'll do my own thing. I'll work yeah. seven days. Dang it, you know. Yeah. Okay. Good luck with that. See how long that nature, lasts. That rebelliousness in us. Sure. Oh man. Yeah, it's like it, it, you look at our culture, and, and if you've if you've if you've had kids and you've raised kids and you've gotten through uh, the the single digits and into the well, no, no, teens are just as bad in a different way. If you if you've gotten them out of the house and you've, sure. you've you you can relate to the Lord in some sense because I mean 
this is the continual process of humanity, that rebellious nature, that contentious nature. Right. Don't tell me what to do. And right. It's like, but what I want for you is good. Yeah. So God puts this construct of time in place. Okay. Yeah. So, so it must be good. It must be good. So the next question is how we observe time. We yes. observe it from a linear, we think of time in a linear way. Yes. And I think, you know, we kind of see that because we've all grown up in school with timelines. Yes. We kind of think of our own life. We were beginning. So, you know, here we are in the middle. You look back to when you're little, your first memories, you think, and you kind of think through your life in this linear motion track, you come to the present and then you think of the future. And so wherever you are in the continuum of the 75, 80 to 90 years, you're going to live on this planet. You, you have a beginning and a middle and you look toward the end. Right. So we think of it in a linear way. Yeah. But time doesn't necessarily function that way. Right. And so God is anytime you have something linear with a beginning and the end, you have something that's measurable. Yes. And something that's finite. Correct. Something that's very limited in its in its duration and its scope. Yeah. So anytime you have anything finite with a border on it, you've got something beyond the border. Mm-hmm. So let's explore that a little bit in our conversation. What's <laughs> good luck with that. Something light. <laughs> something easy. Something light for yes. a, a, for a podcast. <laughs> Paltry philosophical. Right. Topic. So we've got our time. This is the life of Dave, the life of Mike. It's a it's a line. It's it's it has a beginning and the end. What is outside of it? Yeah. Well, the scripture says that our immaterial portion of who we are is eternal. And so that's a that's a reality. I have to ask you a question about that. Okay. When we think about the difference between eternal and everlasting, because mm. I've always thought, and and I want to, and I want you to Are we talk about golf stoppers now. Well, you a said bit. everlasting. Okay, Ever- <laughs> everlasting golf stoppers, <laughs> kind of. Well, I think of God as everlast. Uh, God is eternal. Yes. Without beginning, without end. Right. But I'm not eternal. That's right. But I am everlasting. Mm. Good distinction. Right. Yeah. So everlasting has a beginning, yeah. but no end. Because we're not Mormons. We, no, we weren't spirit babies in heaven no. before. Right, right. So, so, but so seriously, on that. Just, <laughs> okay, Mister. <laughs> I'm just saying. Let's make the distinction. He's people. here all week. We're not Mormons. Okay, we're not. Mormons. No, we're not Mormons. Okay, okay. But so God is eternal, without beginning and without end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you think it's a correct definition to say yeah. well, when we are everlasting? We've I had a beginning. So. Yeah. So we're not going to have an end. That's right. So. Our issue about our future is not whether we have one. Yeah. Our future is about location, location, location. Yes. So after we die, we don't truly die. Our bodies yeah. die. Our spirit lives on because Correct. we are everlasting. Yes. And see, and the reason I come back to that is when I go back to Genesis, and it says, and God breathed into man and he became a living, living. soul. Yes. What, when God breathes life, it's an everlasting life. God doesn't breathe when, you know, God is life. Yeah. So when God's breath is put in, yeah. that's not a temporary no. life. No. So now this life that God has given us is going to go on beyond the linear measurement of our time dimension. Yeah, forever. Right. So if we're going to live outside of the... If... If my if my physical life in my body is limited, but my spiritual my my soul goes beyond that boundary, mm-hmm. I am going to transcend out of this time continuum yes. into another construct. Yeah, that's a pretty massive thing for folks to get their heads around. It is, and it's overwhelming, e- even for people like you and I who've given it. Uh, probably a good deal a lot, of thought right. and, and, have, and search the scriptures to try to understand these things as much as we're able to, it's still overwhelming. Right. It's overwhelming to think about eternity with Jesus. You know, people ask me all the time, I say, well, aren't, you, aren't we going to get bored in heaven? Right. And, and, I, and I say, no, I don't, I don't think we will, um, but, I don't, but I don't know all the reasons why we won't 
except that we'll be with God. And you're talking about an infinite being that we'll have unfettered access to. You're never going to plumb the depths of who he is. Right. So there's, there's no reaching an end point of discovery. Well, see, this, is, this comes back to when God was finished creation on the sixth day. Yeah. He said, and it was good. Yes. So what God creates is good. And, and then he makes this statement in the scriptures. He said, um, I has not seen nor ear heard nor has it entered into the heart of man yeah. what God has prepared for those who love him. That's right. Now, I'm going to tell you, I can think of some pretty insane, crazy, fun stuff to do. Right. I mean, and I'm not being I'm not, I'm not, not being facetious when I say this. Right. Like, I'm thinking, like, I, I saw the video the other day of these guys that put on these... The wingsuits. The wingsuits, right? I love it. Which I go, that looks absolutely insane. Yeah. I mean, I love the concept. Would I do it? Because mm. you're not, you know, you might put the wingsuit on, okay? Yeah. You're not flying. Right. You're falling with class. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Falling with style. <laughs> right? That's, yeah. You're falling in style, but you're still falling, okay? Right. And so I look at that and I go, but <laughs> I mean, to be able to fly, like, I mean, I've often thought, what would, I mean, man has thought like to fly. I know. Man has looked at birds ever since he was created, go, man, I want to do that. Yeah. And the closest we've got to it is, of course, the airline industry, yeah. which that's a sad replica of what the first desire <laughs> yes. was. Lineups and and, right. and uh, we were closer secure. with the Wright brothers we were, than we are today. That's right, because I don't think the Wright brothers thought about security and not right. being able to bring your your, <laughs> your fingernail clipper on board with you or cramming like hundreds of people, people into a yes. tube with wings on it. But so I like the Wright brothers concept better. But yeah. so <laughs> even when you think about that, and and a man has been fascinated with flight. Yeah. And I thought, you know, and then you see Jesus post resurrection, and he appears in the room. I think, well, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So, so you see things, and you and you. See, the Bible talks about things that that critics would go, "That's nuts. That's that doesn't even make sense." Yeah. Again, speaking with authority without knowledge. Yeah. On something outside of this dimension that you have no real understanding or that's knowledge right. of. That's right. Critiquing it without any basis of you know we're observing and then we critique right. versus humbly going what does this mean so back to the whole concept of heaven and this dimension outside of time there's so much that god has prepared Mm -hmm. for us to experience um i'm not i'm not bored with this life right i'm having the i'm having the greatest time i've ever had and life is life can be life is amazing when when you're doing the right things. Right. So all that to say that I don't think you're going to get bored having lots more time. No. But it's still hard. I think it's still hard for people. And I know for me included, it's still hard to conceptualize that. Sure you can believe that a thing is true mm-hmm. and still struggle to understand yes. it and in, 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 an, in an emotional way, embrace it. Right. And so I think that that's really how most people interact with the concept of heaven or eternity future. It's like, okay, I believe these things because the Bible says some of these things clearly about right. this is going to be good. We're going to be in the presence of God, uh, the, new, the new Jerusalem and the, the tree of life on both sides of the river. And, right. Uh, all those things are true, but I don't understand, at least in an emotional level, sure. how I'm going to be there for millennia after millennia and not get bored. Right. And, and I, what I say to people is like, if you, so if, if you die and you suddenly find yourself in a place where you're bored, that's hell. It's not heaven. Right? If you, if mm-hmm. It's a place where you, the, the repetition of the monotony right. of the thing, and, and I think that really is part of, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. you know, the lake of fire. Mm-hmm. There's, there's no changing circumstance there. It's the same. Right. It's the same. It's the same. Right. And it never ends. And I think that's part of the, mm-hmm. what, what was it, just badness? The, yeah. The, 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 yeah. The reality, the torment, the yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so coming back then to this whole, we're in this linear moment in the in our physical realm. Um, it, it's interesting. I, we did an experiment when we were kids. Do you remember the old, the, the remember the old record players that you you know the full like little suitcases and you'd, you'd open the lid, fold mm-hmm. out, and put the record on, and put the needle. Yeah. So, um, 
the reason why I, I even use this analogy because I, I think it's important. We listen to music mm-hmm. in a linear format. We have a beginning. Yeah. <clears throat> in fact, music, a song, is very similar to our life. You know, you have a, you have an opening introduction. Mm-hmm. You have verse one. You have a chorus. You have verse two. You have a chorus. You might have a bridge or a musical interlude, another chorus, and then an ending. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, you know, we have we have our toddlerhood. We have our school life. We have merit. You know, we 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 have these. Chapters and verses and choruses yes, of our life. That's right. Okay, and yet we look at our life in a linear motion. So, so we did one time. We, we took the right. We had two record players. We took the record, put it on the one turntable, put the needle at the beginning of the song. Okay, saddle up the next record player. Took the needle because it moved it, and we put it. And you could literally hear the beginning of the song and the and end the of the answer. song at the same time. Wow. So in that stupid little experiment, <laughs> we transcended linear time mm. as kids. Yeah. Time was transcended in that moment because you're hearing something at the beginning and and something at the end simultaneously. Yeah. So when God is outside of time, he sees the beginning of my days and the end of my days at once. Right. People say, well, how is that possible? Well, it's possible even in the little experiment that we did with the two record players. Yeah. Even us as kids with not much brain power at all, because I remember when I was a junior higher, um, <laughs> transcended time for a moment. Right. And we heard the beginning and the end simultaneously. Right. Now, you could argue, well, but the actual song was recorded in a linear fashion and it was actually prepared. So... And I would say that God knows the number of my days in advance yeah. as well, yeah. and they're recorded in his book. Yeah. So all of a sudden now, I am dealing with a God who is outside of this construct, Yes. not only able to see outside of it, but saw it in advance. Yeah. He's above it. He's outside of it. Completely. He, yeah. So he's not only outside the beginning of it, he's outside the end of it. Yeah. And I think that's the pro that's the that's the greatest brain twist I have with the eternal yeah. nature of God is that I'm living in this yeah. harsh bubble of my linear time frame and God goes, Yeah, but I saw your first day and I've also I've already seen your last day. Yes. That's humbling. Mm-hmm. That's really humbling. And not just you, but every person on the planet and every person who's ever lived from Adam to today right. and who will live until the return of Christ. Right. He's, he's, he knows it all absolutely. Right. So you can look at the world's greatest computers and there are computers. I mean, you look at the internet, what it does today. Right. And you think that God's intellectual capacity in his mind can computate all that information. Yes. At once, in the past, in the future, yeah. and track it all. We're dealing with an intelligence. People say, you know, not only do I believe, I say to people, not only do I believe in intelligent design, I believe in really, really, really intelligent <laughs> design. I'm so convinced of intelligence. It's the intelligence beyond the intelligence. Yeah, yeah. It has I to agree. be. It has to be. There's no other explanation. There is no other explanation. Because you don't look at anything else in in the world that man is, and this is the, this is the hypocrisy that I see in the secular age. Yeah, we don't look at things and just blow them off as objects of random. I don't look at this microphone and go random. Yeah, right. I mean, it's it's the I mean, it's a microphone for pity's sakes. It is not even that complicated. Yet it's a completely designed mechanism, and this one shoots from both sides, and blah 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 right. blah blah. I mean, the design knowledge and technical testing and all the things that went into making this so you can hear our voice right now it's phenomenal and that's just a microphone but there there are these guys called geologists and they think the same thing about rocks that rock formed here this volcanic eruption these things or this fossil this animal got trapped here in this mudslide and now it's and and they they look at all that and they go that happened in this way and it came about and and under these circumstances and it's like okay, so then there's there's order here. I didn't. It's n- there's not randomness and chaos. Right. There's there's processes that are happening, 
even at the the level where we just we just blow it off we just don't even look at that because that doesn't mean anything to us but at every strata of our experience in this world there is order and design and intelligence behind all of it i saw a video the other day of a rock that these geologists are saying that's a fossilized rock now i don't know how they can tell that i'm not a geologist sure but the guy spent 280 hours chiseling away and within that rock was a fossilized crab. I've seen that video, yeah. That was insane to yeah. me. Now, I mean, the intricacy that he had to, to, to he had a fine grinding tool, right. 280 hours. That's a long, long time. Yeah. That's at least a day or two. <laughs> if you measure time. <laughs> Depending on the time. Right. So so you look at that and you go, that that it blew my mind. How mm-hmm. Well, when did that happen, and how did that happen? All that, all that. Now, we wandered off the trail here a little bit on time, sure. but how did we get over there on the fossilized rock? See, it's fine. We have all the time we need. Okay. So. <laughs> well, come up. So, how did we get there on that? I, <laughs> I hate when I do this. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So you, you were because you were talking about geology before that, about the measurement, well, everything, just all oh, the yeah. intricacy of design. That's yeah. what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Duh. So coming back to that, so you look at you look at all of the the, the things around our, our world, and you see intricacy, you see intelligence, you see all that. So then, to, so to, to somehow look at the things that we don't know and dismiss it, right? And that's the problem, I guess, I have, and I think that's what seekers are now looking for. They're going, I'm tired of just having it dismissed, right? Or not having this stuff make sense, yeah. It's got to make more sense than what we've been spoon-fed for the last hundred years through the evolutionary secularist worldview. It just is not adding up. Right. And and I and I love the the some of the new intelligent design thinkers. Right. You know our guy here in Seattle. Uh, uh, I forgot his name again, but I've quoted him before. Uh, anyway, um, where they're coming back to the the acknowledgement that we are living in a very designed. Yeah, world and atmosphere. So coming back to time. So we got this linear thing. We 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 can be even outside of it. What does that actually say to us about eternity and where God lives? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I have the verbiage to put to some of these concepts. It's it's it hurts my brain enough to even try to think about some of these things. But one of the takeaways for me is just the level of accountability, right? We're given, like you said in the opening, maybe 65, between 65 and 90 years on average to live on this planet, uh, to, to respond to the creation, to the revelation that God's given us, right. and, and to, to live according to that. And then we will spend the rest of eternity future well, you said ever, the term everlasting, either uh, enjoying God, the God who made us, mm-hmm. or uh, being punished because we refused to embrace his payment for our sins. And that's a long time. I tell people all the time, I share the gospel with them, I say, listen, forever is a long time to be wrong about well, what you believe. Right. So this this issue of time really is... Uh, I think it's essential to the gospel and essential to us as Christians to to recognize that we have a limited commodity right now. God's given us a stewardship. Mm-hmm. We think about this in other ways. We think about um, our money this way. We think about other other things that we possess as commodities to be used. And as Christians, you and I as pastors especially would say to the people in our churches, Everything that you've been given, everything is a stewardship. Right. And and God will hold you accountable for how you steward. But especially this issue of time. Are we are we utilizing the time that we have on this earth right. in the communities in which God has placed us with the knowledge that He's given us of His Word to reach other people with the love of Christ and with the gospel? Yeah. And I, I think coming with that whole accountability question. The fact that our physical life is so finite, that I think that to me makes is the biggest testimony, or the biggest um, 
it's the biggest wake up call for me on the reality beyond that moment. In that, in that, if 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 this if this is so finite, if it means nothing, then really, party smoked dope and be yeah. happy. Okay, yeah. I mean, really, who cares? Yeah. But all of us inside of our heart want to improve ourselves. We want to maximize. Why are we fascinated? Now, why is our culture fascinated with staying young? Yeah. Because, see, I say mm. that the, 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 the end date on human existence in this physical, that, that was something imposed by us. Because sin, when, when, when God said to Adam, he said, now listen, you know, eating of this tree... You will die. Yes. And dying, you will surely die. Right now, you've been designed, Adam, to live. Okay? Adam had an everlasting life, a physical everlasting life. Yeah. But he said, if you disobey, then dying, you will surely die. A death process is going to begin, and your physical life will end. Yes. Well, the only part of the... So we live in this fallen state now where my physical life doesn't match... My spiritual or my my yeah. my the my soul life, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And so, therefore, that is that's a problem for me, right? So, God, when He says to Adam, "Dying, you will surely die." This end, this end zone, is because of sin, right? So, what God had planned. And the redemptive process is to remove this barrier problem that dying we're going so that we can live in what he in the original way we're created with him in fellowship yeah. and in relationship. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a pretty massive change to my thinking. Yeah. Even as a even if I'm not an unbeliever, even if I don't even believe in anything except I'm trying to figure this out. If there's nothing beyond the end. Nothing matters, so just go and whatever. Right. But if something does exist beyond the end, then you better figure out what it is. Yeah. Because like you said, eternity is a long time to be wrong. Yeah. yeah, if there's nothing there, then party on, Wayne. Right. Party on, Garth, right? But this is the, to the point. So there, there are two op- God keeps giving us options. So man wants to, to copy or create, make our own option. Right. God's given us an option. We don't want largely what he's offered us so we come up with more what what i i'm trying to remember the author's name that i read it calls them mortality mitigation projects Mm. we want to live forever some people donate tons of money to a college to have a building named after them yes Uh, that's a mortality mitigation project yes some people like there's a whole thing in arizona right now there's a there's a, a lab that will freeze your brain when you die or Prior to your death, right, in the hopes that somehow technology in the next hundred years will discover how to bring you back, right. It's like, have you ever frozen a sponge? Do you know what happens when the when the, when it freezes and the, the water the the moisture expands? It gets soggy. It, it, well, no, <laughs> it, 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 it cracks and yeah. breaks. Right. There's no repairing that. No. Right. No. So it's just those kind of things where we're so determined. To, to not go God's way, we want to live forever. But but I think that's part of part of eternity future in 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 the lake of fire is God has given you over to your own way. Yeah, I you know we could maybe talk about hell one of these days because yeah, hell is everything God isn't. Right. And I've often used this with people. God loves you so much that if you don't want Him, He'll give you what you want which is everything that he isn't right and that is hell yeah it's a real simple thing you extract people go, well when i die man i'm gonna party with my friends right. wrong party is something that god created the joy yeah friendship god created so no party yeah. in hell no friends in hell okay so next question you know yeah well i'm gonna do whatever i want actually uh you know being a free moral agent that's something that god's given you the ability of now in hell you will not have a free moral agency right so you're going to be a victim of your circumstance mm-hmm. you're going to be the prisoner in solitary and the greatest torture of hell is not the fire. No. The greatest torture of hell is you remembering every opportunity you had to come to Christ and refused. That's right. That's going to be the greatest torture. Yeah. Okay. So the bottom line of all that is we know that if 
If there was nothing beyond the end, why are we so fascinated with avoiding the end, staying young, and science fiction and life movies and all of those things? Yeah. Now, one of the things I found interesting about the movie Groundhog Day, which is an old movie now. Remember Bill Murray, Groundhog Day? Oh, I love that movie. It was a great film. Yeah. So, Bill Murray is stuck in a 24-hour cycle. Right. And so he repeats the day every day. If you've never seen the movie, go out and rent it because it's fun. But it it paints a great truth. In his day, he is able to learn new things and retain what he's learned. Yeah. But everyone else resets the next day, Mm -hmm. which puts him in this. It puts him in this almost immortal type state because he has knowledge about everything because right. he's growing every day while everything around him is staying stagnant. Yes. Right? And I thought about that for for an instant. Well, I thought about it a lot, actually. And I, I thought to myself <laughs> about the time we live. Mm. We are stuck in a time continuum that's not stagnant. It's moving. Yeah. But we're definitely within it. And we're able, to, we are able in this life period to learn more and more and more and more and more every day. Yeah. Okay. There's a time coming where we will take what we know and we either apply it into our future beyond death or we're going to go into death without having accumulated the knowledge that we need to prepare for that life. Yeah. But that life, that destination, that rendezvous is coming for all of us. Yes. So going toward it unprepared, right? It's like Bill Murray living in Groundhog Day and just staying in his hotel room every day, right? Okay, that's right. So that that's the analogy. It's like if he stayed in his hotel room, it would have been an absolute. He was, <laughs> but because he got out and lived and grew, yeah. In the confinement of the time he was in, he was able to transcend, and it it opened up a whole new world for him. Yeah. The same is true for us. If we take advantage of this linear time continuum yes and learn what god reveals right receive and study and dig out the meaning we're preparing ourselves for something way grander in the future yeah absolutely amen if i could if i could just piggyback on that and and maybe impart a sense of urgency to Mm -hmm. anybody watching our podcast or listening uh, the two of you that have found it uh, at this point. That's right. It's, <laughs> both, it's, both, it's, both viewers. Um, <laughs> so I have, I have this theory. I, I developed this theory years ago. It's called the bathtub theory. And, and so what, what, I hope, what I hope to do by extrapolating this is to, to yeah. get especially Christians going, oh, man, we, we need to be busy about the gospel, not for the sake of looking busy, but because we need to obey Christ. Um, but so, so but it we, also transcends for the person that's a searcher. Right. People that are watching right now that haven't figured this out yet. That's right. So which we, we're trying to really appeal to that student, that that yeah. 25 year old, that guy that's 30 yeah. year old, whatever, trying to figure this all out. Yeah. So the issue of the urgency of your illustration, right. I think, goes far beyond. It, it applies to everybody. Right. Okay. So so when you're a kid, you know, you get a bath. Mom, mom or dad goes, runs the tub full of water. They put you in the bath. And yeah. depending on how small or how big you are, they might walk away and leave you there. Right. Um, and so you're splashing around. Rubber as, ducky. As, yeah. At some point, um, you know, we should sing the song. You know, well, so Bert and Ernie right now. Yeah. Um, that's so sad. Bert and Ernie. Uh, anyway, another podcast for another time. Yes, Bert and Ernie. Um, yeah, so, so mom and dad, one of them comes back at some point, and it's time to get out of the tub. And you're bummed because you've just been enjoying your tub time. Right. And they'll reach down, and then they'll pull that plug out. And now the water's draining. It's over. Fun is over. We're yeah. done. But what happens is water that water drains at a constant. And unless anything, you know, you get a, a toy over the drain sure. or something obst- obstructing right. that, it's going to drain. But absent constant. from that, it's, yeah. gonna, it's a constant. It's, it's a constant flow. And, um, and then you, your water level gets down to the last two inches and you get that whirlpool going, right? Yes. Yeah. And it has the illusion, it has the effect, it feels like the water is draining faster, it's going more quickly, but the reality is the water drains at a constant and gravity is a constant and the, and the water, you know, all of that. So it's, it's draining. And, um, and so here's what, I, here's what I think is happening. Because for the last 10, 12 years, I've asked my kids, my kids' friends, uh, people in their late um, 
well, yeah, late, well, early teens to, to mid twenties. Sure. Consistently, you know, this is the kind of conversation you hear your parents yes. have when you're young and they're right. oh, isn't time speeding up? It seems like it's going so much faster. You hear these folks standing over there in their forties and fifties right. and you go, whatever. I'm having that right. conversation sometimes now. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but, but so I'm hearing kids 12, 13, 14 years old. Talk to me about, yes. it feels like time is really going fast. And I began to just really press into that and go, why are we, yeah. why? and I think it's because, this is my theory, there's relatively less time left for, for us. Mm. I think that we're coming to the ending of the age. I think we're coming to the return of Christ. And I think time is running out. There's, there's not much time left in the bathtub. So when we look at this thing about you know linear time of our personal lives, the 80 to 90 years, yeah. you're saying that not only do we experience that on an individual basis, collectively. but collectively as a culture yeah. over the last seven, if you believe in, a, in, in the scriptural context, as I do, that we've had about seven, 6,000, 7,000 years of world history. Yeah. You're saying, hey, gang, the bathtub of our world history is just about drained out. That's exactly what I'm saying. And I, I can't help but agree with that. I, and I, I think that even though we don't want to admit that, I think a lot of times... I think there's something in the collective consciousness of our culture that feels yes. something is happening on a global scale. Yeah. Yeah. Existentially that is is we're coming up to something. Yeah. Where there's a if you talk to and I talk to a lot of people as you do, there is a stress about the future. Yeah. For I think the first time in our histories anyway where people are way more worried about the future than they've ever been. Yeah. They're literally stressed about how their kids are going to make it, how they're going to go into retirement, yeah. how what the economy is going to look like, what our purchasing power is going to look like, yes. health, COVID, all of those things. Yeah. There is something in the collective consciousness of our culture that is saying something is something seems to be wrong or very coming, different or different that's yeah. a good word yeah. something's very different about this time period yeah and I think you, we could go through tons of verses dozens of passages you know things like uh, men's hearts will fail them right and I think it all ties into what you just described the, the level of stress the unknown um, what's going to happen is, is unprecedented and it's at a global scale it's not just a particular nation state that's struggling or a, or a village or a town or a region right it's global and people and I've said this for a long time now you know with the advent of CNN and and all the global news networks and, and we're constantly inundated with yes. problems happening around the globe that you can't I even can't, solve I can't, or, right I have no ability to do anything about that and so but I'm still being burdened with it. Yes. And I don't need to carry the weight of that. That's, right. and so, so all of this is just weighing yes. on people and it's feeding this frenzy and we're coming to this to some tipping point. Here, right. Right? Well, I think what we should do is we should continue this into time part two. Okay. And I think we should talk about um, the lessons or the warnings mm of what the end of the bathtub drain is going to look like. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, because if time, and I, I like what you're saying about that whole thing, if time is speeding up, if if, if we're coming to the end of the bathtub cycle, yeah. as you've suggested, what does the scripture say culture is going to look like mm. in those last moments before the bathtub drains? Yeah. And I think does that correspond? Does it correspond yeah. with where we are today? Exactly. So what was said, you know, two and three thousand years ago from the Old Testament, three thousand, two thousand from the New Testament, what we'll do is we'll go away, we'll come back for our listeners to say, okay, here's what the scripture says mm -hmm. about what the world is gonna look like. Yeah in the last moments of the bathtub draining. And then our viewers and listeners can just uh, decide for themselves. Absolutely. You, you can say, well, are these guys talking smack? Yeah. Or is this is this something that has got a, a predictive um, message and a predictive pattern yeah. that we can observe today we, from an ancient text? Are we at the end of our shelf life? Yeah. That's Absolutely. an interesting... Okay. 
Well, this has been great, man. Yeah. Again, hey, thanks for tuning in. This has been Thought Rock. Remember, we're at the beginning of a thought revolution. Thanks for t- watching Thought Rock today. I'm Dave Hensman. This is my good friend, Mike Satterfield. And we hope you've enjoyed this episode. Tune in again, and we'll continue our chat about time. And uh, if for not, it's running up. Thanks for being here, Mike. Yeah, thank you.